Hello. Um, are there some steps we could learn for solving problems nonviolently? Um, many of my students at the college level say that they wish they had uh, learned more about nonviolence earlier in their schooling because it would have helped them to uh, solve a lot of problems that they had. Um, well, uh, I'm going to talk about problem solving at um, lar a large scale level and also at the smaller scale daily level that most of us um, experience most frequently. We're solving problems nonviolently all the time, but we don't generally call them nonviolent. <clears throat> um, Martin Luther King is noted for tackling some very large and difficult problems. And the steps that I'm going to talk about here are derived from his famous letter from the Birmingham jail, 1963. Uh, Dr. King came to the city of Birmingham, Alabama, because he said that uh, it was the most segregated city in the United States. And it had been a, a hundred years already since the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, but uh, during the campaign, uh, he was arrested for parading without a permit. He had led a march uh, that was technically against the law. He was arrested. He was in jail for about eight days. And he took this time to write a long and very eloquent letter, which uh, has become a piece of American literature that that every student should read, every American should know. Uh, this, it's called The Letter from the Birmingham Jail. And um, Dr. King had been accused of being an outside agitator who had come to the city for emotional reasons and on impulse. And uh, uh, he, he, his language was always very diplomatic and um, even though he had a lot of anger over that accusation, I'm sure. But he explained in the letter, at the you near know, the beginning of the letter, that no, he wasn't an outside agitator. He had, first of all, been invited to come to Birmingham. Um, and uh, that he and his staff had gone through a number of steps uh, before showing up in Birmingham and conducting their campaign. <clears throat> the first step was a collection of facts to determine whether injustice existed. And they felt they had uh, a lot of reason to uh, say that injustice existed in Birmingham. Second was negotiation. Uh, Dr. King made repeated attempts to negotiate and eventually negotiations did take place uh, after the federal government became involved. Um, third, self-purification, a very Kingian step, very much in the spirit of Dr. King. Um, and we'll see how that evolved into a step in our modern approach to nonviolence training. And fourth, his fourth step was direct action. And that consisted of the marches, the protests, the boycotts, the sit-ins, um, the demonstrations that were met with violent force in Birmingham, um, with fire hoses and police dogs being used on young demonstrators. And those pictures <clears throat> were shown all around the world. And they greatly embarrassed the United States to the point where President Kennedy at the time uh, brought the leaders of Birmingham together with Dr. King to negotiate a settlement. Um, and um, 
that settlement between Dr. King and Birmingham became like a first draft of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. <clears throat> At the federal level, Congress pa passed the Civil Rights Act several months after uh, Birmingham. And uh, it built on what had been agreed on in Birmingham. In the Birmingham Agreement, you had uh, an opening up of employment and the use of public facilities and public businesses. And it could not be um, on a basis of discrimination, whether by race, by color, by national origin, by religion. And at the federal level, the Civil Rights Act added sex. And uh, the Civil Rights Act with sex included as a basis of non-discrimination opened the doors of higher education and employment to women as well as to um, racial minorities who had been discriminated against um, lawfully before, before that law was passed. A great, great achievement from Dr. King's movement. Um, well, let's uh, take a look at the steps for nonviolent problem solving that we use today. I'm, I'm describing, as I am in a number of other videos, I'm, I'm describing a portion of the Kingian nonviolence curriculum that was written by uh, Dr. Bernard Lafayette um, and uh, his colleague, Dr. Jensen, and um, David Jensen. Um, I, uh, I mean, I'm a high level trainer in the Kingian nonviolence uh, system. What I add to it is uh, a background in psychology and some of the other social sciences. And uh, my background as kind of a data nerd. And um, uh, so I'll, I'll describe these six steps that we use today and add some commentary based on that additional uh, background that I bring to this. First uh, is information gathering. I think I'll show you a visual just to illustrate these six steps. There we go. Information gathering. Uh, this, uh, of course, is derived from Dr. King's uh, listing of his first step was collection of facts to determine whether injustice exists. And in a, a nonviolent campaign like Birmingham, that's what you're, you really want to have a good understanding that you are addressing a problem of injustice. And uh, that's what it meant on a large scale. On a smaller scale, information gathering should be our first step in a lot of the little problems that we try to solve. Uh, it, um, sometimes the information gathering that we do is more conscious and sometimes it's not so conscious because we're so familiar with the little problems that we solve every day that we don't even think about it. But uh, in this connection, I like a story that comes from The Road Less Traveled by Scott Peck. And uh, he tells how when he was in his 30s, he was not very handy. And he didn't think of himself as somebody who could fix things and um, uh, solve mechanical problems. But one of his patients had a problem with her car one day. Um, the, uh, the parking brake was stuck or something. And he uh, took a look at it. He took the time to gather information about this problem she was having. And he crawled under her car. And he took the time to look at some of the rods and wires and connections that were under there. And he saw where the parking brake was. 
And he saw that by moving uh, one lash with his hand, uh, he could free up the mechanism and, and release the parking brake. Um, so in he his story tells how he became aware of how he could become more skillful at this step of information gathering, and that that would enable him to solve problems that previously he didn't think he could solve. Um, now, a lot of our problems uh, that threaten us at times with violence or hostility from others, they're social. And, and so for many problems that we're trying to learn about and, and decide what to do about, it's rather important to educate others about what we are thinking about, what we have found. Um, the word stakeholder means anybody who uh, cares about or has an interest in this problem and whether it gets solved or not. Um, so the, the step of education means uh, taking the information that you've learned and sharing it with others. You know, a, as an old academic, I think of information gathering as research and I think of education as teaching or discussing. And um, that, but that's just me. These, uh, these two steps are the, the important front end of nonviolent problem solving. And I, would, I venture to say that most problems get solved at these first two steps. Um, some of the other steps may be necessary, may not be necessary, but um, those first two are very important. Let's take a look at the next one. Personal commitment. This is how Dr. King's listing of self-purification shows up in the nonviolence training that we do today. Personal commitment. Now, this is a, a, a point at which we recognize that um, uh, we may not be the person to solve this problem or the problem may not be ready to be solved because problems evolve over time and, and they ripen. And sometimes the, the point at which they can be solved is not now, but it might be a few weeks from now. Um, so uh, are we willing to go ahead, to go further in the problem solving process? Maybe the answer is gonna be no. And that may be the biggest contribution that you can make to the nonviolent resolution of the problem eventually is not to jump in prematurely um, or not to try to do something that someone else would really be better for, but to just go easy and make a conscious judgment about whether this is a battle that needs to be fought now by me. Um, sometimes the answer will be yes, sometimes no. Now the fourth step is negotiation. And um, it's, it's in here because it may be necessary, it may not be necessary, but you're often dealing with people who don't agree with you. And um, very often problems remain in place because the two sides who don't ag agree with each other refuse to talk to each other. That's a very common uh, state of affairs. But negotiation means trying to get a, sitting down at a table, talking about the problem and trying to come to a common description of it. Trying to understand each other's positions well enough so that you can translate them into a common description. Once that is done, a solution is often minutes away. But um, uh, negotiation is, it, it's necessary for difficult problems that involve an opposition between two sides. Uh, I have it 
experienced uh, negotiations between labor and management, they often follow, nowadays, they often follow a model uh, called principled negotiation or interest-based negotiation. Both of those terms are used. And uh, the driving person behind that approach uh, was Roger Fisher, who taught at the Harvard Business School. He and uh, several co-authors wrote a book called Getting to Yes, which is one of the best-selling books in the world. <laughs> and uh, it's a very good um, breakdown, very easy to read, but to break down this step of negotiation and have it be consistent with the Kingian framework that we're using, that would be a very strong recommendation from me. Um, the, the book, Getting to Yes, is also almost an expansion of this uh, fourth step of negotiation. And uh, for people who really want to understand it, I, I, I think they should read that book. Direct action may be necessary. It may be necessary to get back to negotiation because sometimes, especially in the first round, negotiations break down and uh, perhaps there needs to be a strike, for example, in a, a labor negotiation. Um, or there needs to be a, a protest or a boycott in perhaps a civil rights situation or uh, a situation protesting economic injustice. Um, the purpose of direct action is to get back to negotiation. And if a movement, for example, um, it could be labor, it could be the civil rights uh, community, if, if that movement conducts direct action in a nonviolent way, they are likely to win public support. And they are likely to be seen as responsible parties who can be, um, who can receive help, perhaps from the federal government or from other uh, powerful agencies in, in the society. Um, Nonviolence often attracts funding that can be very useful, of course, for, for almost any uh, purpose or problem that you're trying to get solved. So uh, the step of direct action is, um, you know, the spotlight is on you and how you conduct direct action is very important. But the purpose is to get back to negotiation. The sixth step um, is reconciliation. It wasn't one of Dr. King's original four steps in the letter from Birmingham jail, but it is implied in the way Dr. King ran that campaign and in other things that he has written. <clears throat> uh, what does reconciliation mean? Well, if you have seen the video on Dr. King's second principle, uh, that will give you a good sense of what reconciliation means in this um, King framework. Uh, principle two uh, says that we should not seek to defeat and humiliate our opponent, but to win his friendship and understanding. And that's what reconciliation means. It means that we are aiming to reach a point where we can at least be allies with the uh, people on the other side for the purpose of going forward after the negotiation, after the direct action. You know, the, the words the end don't come up on the screen. We have to keep living. And um, reconciliation means that we can do so with those people and at least communicate with them possibly join with them uh, in trying to solve other problems. And uh, reconciliation for many people, especially in emotionally heated conflicts, 
reconciliation is a high bar. But if you set a high bar, if you set a high standard for yourself, then there's lots of room for other uh, bits of conflict resolution and compromise uh, that may not qualify as reconciliation, but they are much better than what we had before. Um, the, um, the value of these six principles is not that there's anything magic about them. Sometimes I think a large part of their value is that they're six steps rather than just one or two. Because often when we rely on violence or doubling down or pushback to solve our problems, uh, we just create more problems and we don't solve the original one. But um, uh, if we are insulted or threatened, we may have been raised to strike back. Uh, we may, may have been told that that's the occasion when it's okay to strike back. But then what? What happens after that? Um, we have an unstable situation where there may be a, a cycle of retaliation that's set into motion. It's not, not very good. You know, human beings can do better. And uh, with the six-step framework that I've described, uh, we have a possibility for uh, a more lasting and satisfactory solution to a problem. And also, we've opened the door to some creativity. Because if we have people who are working as allies now, they may come up with new ideas and new ways to transform the old problem into new situations. Notice that direct action is not the first step. That's another thing that's you know, not unique to this way of approaching problems, but I think it's a key one. We want to uh, go through a number of steps that engage the slower kind of thinking that we can do, which is more rational than our initial impressions of situations. Um, we want to get away from that coin flip where our impressions might be okay, they might be sufficient, but often they're incorrect and they lead us astray. Um, a six-step process is more likely to lead us to satisfactory resolution. So um, that's uh, a rundown on the steps for nonviolent problem solving. Um, and I invite criticism. I know that some of my friends in the Kingian world uh, will criticize my uh, departure from uh, the training manual in some ways. But uh, if you have found this useful, please uh, subscribe to the channel and give this video a like. And uh, I will be back very soon with uh, some more ideas. Thank you.